The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. I want to meet this culinary team. (laughs) Who are they? (laughs) Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. The featured upcoming meals include three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. And crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche sauce. Those two (laughs) recipes, they've been around for a while. And I have to say, if you haven't made them by now, come on. I want to know what the tomato and oregano dipping sauce tastes like. And then you mark your calendar and you say, see in a year, tomato and tomato (laughs) dipping sauce. (laughs) Bye-bye, creme fraiche. (laughs) Yeah. Until 2018. (laughs) Maybe anyway. we'll have a new president the next time you make this recipe. <laughs> Customize your recipes each week based on your preferences. Blue Apron has several delivery options so you can choose what fits your needs. And there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping. By going to blueapron.com slash crooked. That's blueapron.com slash crooked. Blue Apron is... It's a better way to cook. It's a better way to cook. Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On the pod today, we have The Atlantic's Annie Lowry, who's going to talk to us about Trump's budget. And Crooked Media's own Anna Marie Cox will talk about this week's episode of With Friends Like These. We also have Pod Save the World this week. Tommy has a fascinating interview on that. And then uh, we have a big lover to leave it tomorrow, which I'm sure Lovett will tell us more about when he bursts in here to record ads at 10 a.m. Um, <laughs> that means we got to hurry up and get this thing done by 10. Yeah, right. That's true. That's true. Uh, how you doing, Dan? I feel great. <laughs> I feel like a million bucks. You know, how do you feel? I feel outstanding. Um, yeah, I- look, for having a couple three day bachelor party, and then, you know, I'm. 35 years old, I feel like a million bucks. I recover pretty quickly on these things. I walked into the gym last night, uh, and one of the women who works at my gym was like, how was New Orleans? Oh and gosh. I was like, actually, as you can tell by the fact that I am still alive and walking, I did not go to New Orleans, and that I viewed myself as the Pod Safe America designated survivor of the bachelor party. In case you guys all went down, <laughs> I, could keep this, I could keep this thing going. We missed you. Down Call me there. Tom Kirkman. We missed you down there, Dan. Yeah, you. you I know. Survived. I had a lot of FOMO. I have to admit. <laughs> Although I'm not sure, like the six year, seven year age difference between between all of us, it's not readily apparent because my youthful appearance. But I think in a three day bachelor party, it would've been pretty clear. Yeah, I will say that my uh, my many friends now who are fathers who have children at home did not did not quite do as well as uh, some of the rest of us. Those are the worst people on bachelor parties because <laughs> it's like they're one day of freedom. They're like on a furlough from prison and go crazy. <laughs> yes, that is that is exactly what it was like. Um, okay, so we were going to talk about we we're going to start with the CBO score uh, on on Trump Care. Um, but uh, we'll start with something else since since it is the first CBO score in history to quite literally produce a violent reaction among Republicans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh, man. Last night in Montana. So there is a special election today in Montana for Congress. It is the seat that was vacated when um, Ryan Zinke, uh, the congressman from Montana, was chosen uh, by Trump as the interior secretary uh, Trump believed, of course, by choosing Ryan, he would think he, he would um, fill the seat with the Republican because it is a deep, deep red state that was won by 20 points by Trump, by the Republican candidate. Um, there's a first timer Democrat named Rob Quist, who's running for the Democratic nomination. He's running against Republican Greg Gianforte. Gianforte ran for governor last time around and lost narrowly to a Democrat. Um and the race has become unexpectedly close. Gianforte has been ahead the whole time, but he's now ahead by single digits or so. Um, so before yesterday, there's still a feeling that Gianforte would, might be able to squeak it out, but certainly the wind was at Quist's back towards the end, but still a very tough seat. Anyway, 
Gian Forte last night. Good summary. Night. That's an that's, excellent summary. That's my summary of the race so far. Because we actually we want to give people some information before we get into the, the context is key. Here. We get into the crazy stuff. So Gian Forte was doing an interview last night with a local Fox affiliate when Ben Jacobs of the Guardian, a reporter for the Guardian, um, walked into the room, held out his recorder, and asked Gian Forte for his reaction to the CBO score. Um, of course, the CBO score said the head. We'll get into the details later, but the headline was 23 million uninsured over the next decade, thanks to the Republican bill. Um, Gianforte had previously said he would make up his mind on whether he supports Trump care once the CBO score came out. So publicly, he was not saying either way. He said he was waiting for the CBO score. Lucky for him, the score came out the night before the election. So instead of answering Ben Jacobs, um, what Gianforte decided to do is put both hands around his neck and body slam him to the ground in full view of the Fox reporters in the room. And there's also audio of the incident. Uh, Gianforte was later charged with misdemeanor assault. The election is today. What did you... <laughs> I mean... I just I just don't know. I mean, it's... S- Candidate... Look, elections can be very tense. And candidates sometimes... Uh, lose their fucking minds. They lose their cool reporters. at the end. That happens. Yeah. I remember in 2008, Barack Obama came home off the trail to take his daughter's... Uh, trick-or-treating in yeah. Chicago, and the press did not treat that with the appropriate level of privacy that most people and the president and the former president of the United States would have thought, and he got very agitated by it, uh, which was the product of wanting to protect his daughters and two years on the road coming to an end. Yeah. But some people make gaffes at the end. Some people say dumb things. This is the first time that I can think of that a – candidate has actually physically assaulted a reporter. And the thing about this is amazing is there are times where reporters and politicians have heated confrontations or politicians and staffs have heated confrontations. This was not one of those. This was, hey, what do you think about the CBO score? I don't answer your question. No, seriously, what do you think about the CBO score? Boom. And then then he beats him up. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. (laughs) Well, so, I mean, let's place this though. Like, okay, so you could see there's there's one crazy Republican out there, Republican candidate. He goes nuts, beats up a reporter, right? Horrible thing. But let's like let's place it in the context of um, what if we were in a normal political environment? What would happen, right? So what happens there is the guy gets charged with assault. Um, his campaign and he issue a statement where he says, "I'm so sorry. I overreacted. Please find it in your hearts to forgive me." Maybe I'm suspending my campaign, or or at the very least you say, you know, I throw myself at the mercy of Montana's voters, right? Like, I'm, a, I'm an imperfect person, blah, blah, blah. So the, per- the candidate apologized, the campaign apologizes, the national Republicans distance themselves from the candidate, everyone in the political world um, all comes together and condemns this kind of behavior because... Obviously, you're not supposed to kick the shit out of a reporter or anyone when you're a candidate for office, right? Or in any role in life. Like, there's no appropriate time to kick the shit. Unless you are a a UFC, you know, an MMA fighter, (laughs) professional wrestler, boxer. Those are the only times in which said behavior is close to acceptable. So yeah, so there's so there's so many takes on this. But right? it's like the it's first, like it's like imagine all that happening and then but here's the thing, none of that actually happened. That's right. <laughs> none of the none things of I described actually happened. Uh, just silence. Just <sighs> silence from everyone. And so some people point at this and say what Gianforti did is a sign that the Republican party is broken or that Trumpism has taken over. I actually don't think that is true. Yeah. GN40 seems like a crazy asshole. Um, Now, there are a number of crazy assholes in the Republican Party right now, but that happens. Democrats have had members of Congress who, not who have assaulted people, but who have committed crimes, been involved in corruption. Um, But that is, but what, what proves the Republican Party is intellectually and morally bankrupt is the response of their leadership, which is nothing. Which always seems to be the case, by the way. Like yes. crazy, these crazy things happen, whether it's this guy, whether it's Trump, whether it's whatever. And what truly proves how awful uh, and devoid of any good moral sense that today's Republican Party is, is like you say, is the response. Yeah. And there are good there are a number of Republicans 
who have been very, very critical both of Gianforte and the Republican leadership who's been silent. No, those are all Republicans who also happen to be very opposed to Donald Trump. Right. So if right. you have if you have signed on and sold your soul to Trumpism, then you find a way to justify this and stay silent and convince yourself that this is OK or whatever else, because it will help you. It will make you that much easier for you to take health care away from poor people and give it back to rich people in the form of a tax cut. And so you're willing to tolerate any level of behavior. And and it's like the thing like I'm grossed out. By Paul Ryan, who I really have come to, I've decided I don't, I don't like, just to be honest. <laughs> Not on the fence I just, anymore. I've tried, I've looked at him, and I've really come to the conclusion I really don't like him. He has surpassed Marco Rubio on my list. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, we, we love it obviously has a different view, but... Um, also, it's just like, I mean, there's all these different levels of reaction, right? Like, there's the... Uh, like, Laura Ingram tweeted last night... Politicians always need to keep their cool, but what would most Montana men do if body slammed for no reason by another man? Did anyone get his lunch money stolen today and then run to tell the recess monitor? So she's a darling person. Yeah, yeah, she's not. A, she's she's not nice. <laughs> she's a real one. And then Laura Ingram, like people, of course, like went nuts on the fact that she said that, and every single person who criticized her for it, she blocked it. So she's a snowflake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's people like that. Trent Franks, an Arizona congressman this morning, was like, well, uh, the left created this atmosphere of, of tension and confrontation, you know, so it's unfortunate that it had to come to this. So he found a way to blame the left for a Republican candidate body slamming a reporter, which I thought was quite interesting. And then Paul Ryan, your friend, got, did get up there just before we started recording and say... Um, he should apologize. There's no place for violence anywhere, blah, 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 like kind of did his condemning thing. And then, of course, a reporter said, well, would you seat uh, Gianforte if he wins this evening? And, and Paul Ryan said, oh, yeah, well, the people of Montana will have chosen him. So that's all, <laughs> that's all I have Ugh, to say about Paul that. Paul Ryan. <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, so not a great situation. Uh, very interesting that uh, just about every... Uh, local paper, every state paper in Montana has rescinded their endorsement of Gianforte. Uh, even the conservative papers um, led the news in Montana today, led every newspaper along with the CBO score, which I thought was interesting. So um, aside from the gross reaction from um, much of the Republican Party and the conservative establishment, uh, or the conservative entertainment wing, I should say. The next question a lot of people have been asking is, will this will this matter, right? How will this change the votes? How will a how will a Republican candidate body slamming a reporter change the votes today? That's a that's a I can I can assure you, no one knows the answer to that question. So our friends, friend of the pod, Chuck Todd and yeah. Mark Murray, in their tip sheet. Um, first read, first that read, they send out every morning. It's a great, uh, tip which sheet, is excellent. By the way. It is a, it is the, it's the best top one. tip sheet. It is the best tip sheet. By it far. is, it is. Um, I, I, I always leave it not knowing when mid-level house staffers' birthdays are, but <laughs> I get a lot of otherwise useful information. Um, and. But they have a take that basically says that this is a win-win for Republicans, which is the hottest take you can have. Like it literally fire. light the internet on fire. Fire. <sighs> And it, it made, pe- made people very upset. And, I mean, they're not wrong, which I hate to say. Like, they are wrong in the sense that you, it could be couched in a little more moral outrage at reporters being beaten up by uh, politicians. But you can you already can see the spin here. If Quist wins, right. it doesn't tell you anything about Trump Quist, care right. or Trump and Russia or anything else. It means don't run candidates who beat up reporters in the 24 hours before the election, which is, that's also true. And if Gianforte wins, it's going to be Democrats are so fucked. They can't even beat a guy who beat up a reporter 24 hours beforehand. If they can't do that, when will they ever win? Yeah. So like, I have no, I, I have no doubt that it's right. And that that's what the spin will be. And that's what the narrative will be. Um, here's why that's stupid. I think, uh, it's, you know, two, so two thirds of uh, the vote is already in in Montana uh, because a lot of this is mail-in uh, early vote stuff. So 
most of the people in this election have voted already. That's number one. Number two, like, I don't know, you have to get to a place where you think, like, I don't, I mean, you have to get to a place where you think you were going to vote for Gianforte, but then, and, and by the way, Gianforte has abysmal approval ratings, we should also say. He ran, in, when he ran in uh, 16 for governor, he got, uh, I was going to say he got beat up, <laughs> but I guess you can't can't use that metaphor. <laughs> he anymore. got body slammed by the voters. <laughs> yeah. he, got, he had quite a few negative hats run against him, and a very very low approval at the at rating at the end of that. So he's very very disliked. So there's already a lot of people who are saying they're going to vote for Gianforte, even though they disapprove of him before this happened, right? So we we don't actually know how much uh, last night will factor into the uh, vote today, but maybe it will. Who knows? Either way. It's. I was annoyed by this special election going into this because I don't. I don't think Montana, just like Kansas, uh, is not a great test case for whether we're going to see some Democratic wave election in 2018. I think the fact that Rob Quist brought it within single digits of Gianforte um, is a great sign, you know. And who knows? Maybe he gets over the top tonight. Fucking great. Um, but I, I don't know that, you know, him, I think if he loses by 20 points, then yeah, we can say, well, what the hell happened to the democratic wave? Because, um, 20 points was the Republican margin in the last couple of elections. But you know, if he loses by three or four points, I don't know, definitely made progress. And who knows? I think the, maybe people in Montana like someone beating someone up. I don't know. I don't know how voters react. I don't. I don't think they like that. That is the, that to me was the worst take. Was people in the Midwest probably think it's a good idea to beat up reporters? I know, That's I what know. men do. <laughs> um, but you know what? Place, I've, I've stopped trying to guess what's in the minds of some voters in this country. I just well, then uh, you're going to have to turn in your media credentials immediately because that's the primary <laughs> job of a reporter. I just we should just go ask them because I can't, I can't tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only th- place where I think this might matter in any way is I mean, the, the die may already be cast here one way or the other based on the votes that are already in, but is generally Republicans depend on Election Day turnout to overcome some sort of Democratic advantage in early voted mail. I don't know if that's specifically true in Montana, but it certainly mm-hmm. wasn't some of these other races we've looked at. And whether people are not whether this is a disincentive for people to actually go wait in line to vote for this guy. Right. Maybe it matters. On, maybe it matters on the margins. Um, but the result of this race, even if the margin, if the margin is 20, I will be concerned. But the thing that I still take away from this is that Quist has been able to raise huge amounts of money. There's been huge levels of activism on his behalf, both in Montana and around the country. And there's a whole shitload of races that are in districts much closer than this one that where that where that can be the that could tip the tip it in the Democrats favor, enthusiasm, activism and money. And so if that can be replicated behind good candidates in districts across country, then Democrats will be in a good will be in a good spot. Yeah, I was actually I was trying to think of what I would do if the Democratic candidate body slammed someone. And I hadn't voted yet, and it was election day. Um, like, I don't know that I could pull the lever for the Republican for Gianforte because of all of his awful positions and his position on health care and stuff like that. Um, I'd feel it was my civic duty to go vote. So maybe I'd write in someone and vote for all the other candidates in all the other races. Although it's a special yeah, election, not, so I don't know if there's anything else on the ballot. This is not going to lead to votes for Quest. It may just mean fewer votes for Gianforte. Stay home. Right, right, right. Um so anyway, oh, we should also let anyone know who's listening in Montana, of course, you can um, you can register today to vote if you're not registered yet. They have same-day registration. So go vote if you're in Montana. Go vote for Rob Quist. Um, and uh, and careful out there. Don't, you know, if you run into Gene Forte, just sort of uh, go go run and hide. <laughs> Protect yourself. Um, yeah, submit, submit your questions by email. <laughs> Unfucking real. Anyway, let's go on to something far more impactful to most people in this country than uh, the garbage we were just talking about. The CBO score. So uh, we already said the headline for the CBO score is... 23 million would lose health insurance relative to current law over the next decade. Uh, the first draft of the Trump, Trump care was 24 million, so they improved the bill by 1 million people. Good for them. 51 million people under 65 would be uninsured by 2026 under this bill, compared with Obamacare, where 28 million would be under, un, un, uninsured by 2026. Um, one out of six Americans live in places where under this bill 
Uh, CBO says insurers could charge people with pre-existing conditions whatever they wanted. Um, one in six Americans would live in places where coverage would be unavailable or unaffordable for services like mental health, substance abuse, maternity care, etc. All these essential benefits. Um, so this that number comes from... Of course, you know, the, the the compromise that allowed this bill to get through the House was the MacArthur Amendment uh, and the Upton Amendment. What that did is said to some states, you can decide to waive the protections for pre-existing conditions and the requirements to put essential health benefits in every insurance uh, plan. And basically the CBO estimated how many states would actually accept that r- r- waiver and get rid of protections for pre-existing conditions and essential health benefits. And what they've decided was about one in six Americans would be at risk for this. So pretty bad. Pretty bad. Yeah, it's it's bad. Out-of-pocket spending on maternity care for women could increase by $1,000 a year. Premiums, they all bragged about how premiums would come down. Uh, premiums would be 20% higher than with Obamacare in 2018 and 5% higher in 2019. Premiums for a working class 64-year-old could rise 800%. That is not a typo. 800%. If you are 64 years old, meaning you're as, that's as old as you can be, you would not be on Medicare, and if you make 200% of the federal poverty line, um, your premiums would go up 800%. Unbelievable. You have to work hard <laughs> to come up with a bill that is as bad as this one. It is, like I've said this before, there are lots of things that Congress does that are bad policy, but good politics. Then there are a lot of things that are good politics, but bad policy. This is the rare exception of shitty policy, shitty politics. It is absolutely devastating. And I don't, I don't fully understand the psychology in what led them to bring this back up and for Paul Ryan to force his members to vote for this piece for this bill without this information because they own it. That is, it does not matter. Democrats will hang this around their neck for every day until they get booted out of office in 2018 for doing this horrible fucking thing. And if, if this CBO score had come out before it would not have passed just like last time. So, I think the psychology is, again, very difficult to get inside the minds of uh, some of the people in this country, House Republicans at the top of the list. I think the psychology is this was a shit burger we had to pass through the House to just get to the Senate. The Senate will give us a better bill. The Senate will fix it. And then later, if we pass something that is better than this, according to the CBO, um, we can just tell voters, oh, forget that attack about the earlier bill. The, that was an early draft. The bill that we ended up with was a lot better. Um, they also are comforted, of course, in the fact that they have a giant right-wing Republican propaganda machine that exists every day to try to brainwash their voters into thinking that the bill is fine, that it's the Democrats who are the problem, that it was Obamacare that was the problem all the way, um, and don't worry about it. Now, the problem with the psychology is, like, this isn't like any of the other lies that just sort of like float through the Republican media um, and people just believe and that's it. This is actually going to affect people like they are not going to be able to avoid the fact that if the Senate passes something even close to this, millions and millions of people will immediately feel the effects in that they will either lose their health insurance or will not be able to afford the premiums and the coverage that they need. Right. So I don't know. I don't know how they get around this. I think that's right. I think the other reason for this is Paul Ryan wakes up every day so that he can give tax cuts to rich people. That's right. That is his reason for being. And for weird legislative reasons, they need to pass this bill to do that. Need to get to the tax cuts. And there's tax cuts in this bill, too, which they also like. Yes. Yes. I mean, you really... They need to pass the tax cut bill to get to the next tax cut bill. Right. You could not write a better ad for Democrats than taking health insurance, raising premiums on expectant mothers, taking health care away from cancer patients, 800% increases in premiums for elder Americans, all in service of paying for a tax cut for 
millionaires like Donald Trump. It writes itself. I don't even have to focus group it. I know how good it is. It is. <laughs> it's brutal and devastating. And they signed up for it. They just walked right into it knowingly. Except there is one thing. I don't. I think it's not that they relied. They're relying on the right wing filter bubble to um, communicate propaganda to them. I think they believe what the right wing filter bubble is telling them. Yeah. Like Mark Meadows. Right. Yeah. Certainly Chairman Mark of the Freedom Meadows. Caucus. Yeah. So he helped negotiate this deal. And then today would inform or yesterday, I don't know what day it was, informed by a reporter about how this would have what the CBO said about how it would affect uh, people with pre-existing conditions was brought almost to tears by his own vote. And people seem to feel sorry for him. I do not. Who's feeling do not sorry, feel sorry for, for Mark him? Meadows. People are feeling sorry for Mark Meadows for crying over like, well, it's yes. Mark Meadows is the reason that we're in this fucking mess. He's the head of the yes. House Freedom Caucus. Like, they could have, the Tuesday group, these moderate Republicans could have passed, well, I guess they would have passed still a shitty bill, but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have touched pre existing conditions and essential health benefits like maternity care and substance abuse had it not been for Mark Meadows. He is the one who decided he would not support a bill unless they went after pre existing conditions. Yes, his actual view was. The original version of Ryan Care, Trump Care, Wealth Care was not cruel enough to people. So he fought like hell, like he fought like nothing else to, to make it shittier for people. And then when he finds out it's shittier for people that he may know, he almost cries over it. Well, fuck Man, you, Mark Meadows. Too, like, st- too stupid to be in Congress. And it's not a surprise. The CBO says what every single independent expert who looked at this said it would do and so this isn't like holy shit there's a drafting error that means that people with pre-existing conditions are going to get screwed that was the point of the bill but because he gets his news and his staffers get their news from fox where this information was never shared right was never discussed no, they that's... thought they were doing the right thing and they didn't they 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 are it is this full cycle of Republicans write talking points to come up with talking points to sell their plan. They give those talking points to right wing media. Right wing media repeat those talking points as if they're fact, and Republican members believe that as fact. It is just it is it's just a cycle of bullshit. <laughs> the cycle of bullshit. Um, no, I mean so so like you said, this bill it reduces it basically it's very easy to understand this bill. It reduces healthcare spending on the poor, the sick, the working class and the elderly by about 1 trillion dollars and it uses just about all the savings to finance tax cuts that are heavily skewed towards millionaires and billionaires. That is not I will someone can go fact check that if they want. That is not just some democratic talking point. That is not just some like democratic ad though it will be an ad that some consultant wrote and sort of played fast and loose with no. That is pretty much exactly what it does. It's funny the the Repu- we were talking about the Republican response. Like Mark Meadows cried, Greg Gianforte body slammed a reporter, Tom Price, the Health and Human Services Secretary, said that the CBO is wrong again. Um, hey McC- John, question for you: Do you know who appointed the current CBO director? Uh, I believe his name is Tom Price. That is correct. Same Tom Price. <laughs> Same Tom Price. Tom Price is self-appointed. Congressional Budget Office Director um, is wrong, according to Tom Price. And uh, MacArthur, what's MacArthur's first name? Is he Tom, too? Tom. He's Tom. Another Tom. Okay. Tom MacArthur. Um, His quote was, he was the one, of course, that added the amendment that was allowed this whole thing to pass. He said, that is somebody's opinion at CBO. I have a different opinion. Okay. Once again, the Congressional Budget Office is made up of nonpartisan economists. They do not work for either party. Some of them have been appointed by Republicans, like Tom Price. They are economists. They are experts. Who is Tom MacArthur? He is a dipshit congressman for New Jersey. He is not an economist. His opinion does not matter like the CBO's opinion because it is not an opinion. It is an actual economic analysis. Now, Tom MacArthur is not a Fox News pundit. He's not a Freedom Caucus wacko. He is supposedly a moderate Republican member of Congress. And his thought was, well, that's their opinion. And finally... Remember Paul Ryan's reaction? I was going to say, I was getting to that. Finally, Paul Ryan's opinion. I feel good about it. It's great. And why? Like, (laughs) because he sends his... Able staff out to tweet out in a celebratory fashion that this bill reduces deficit by $119 billion. It's like, well, no shit. 
if you take healthcare away from 23 million people and you make devastating cuts to Medicaid, you're going to be able to save money. And if you really wanted to save money, if that was the goal, if the idea was, look, deficit is too high, we have to do something, we can't afford this health care for people, we, we, we would, we're going to repeal Obamacare, but we would certainly keep the taxes in place. But the reason it's only $119 billion instead of hundreds of billions of dollars is because they had to give a massive tax cut to rich people and insurance CEOs. So spare me your fiscal austerity, Paul Ryan. <laughs> so let's have the media reaction. I will say in this case, just about every pundit and every member of the media universally ha- has the same reaction to this, which is, oh my God, how politically unpopular is the CBO score or is this bill terrible for the Republicans, the CBO score? Even conservative pundits who think that the CBO score is wrong were saying, a headline like that, 23 million uninsured, that is going to be awful for Republicans, right? Even even conservatives who disagree with CBO and like the bill said that. There's only one, one pundit that I could find who thought that maybe, only maybe this, this could be a win for Republicans. Chris Saliza tweeted, key dynamic, what matters more, the $119 billion in savings or the 23 million uninsured by 2026? Boy, oh boy. <laughs> he was oh, a lot Chris. of people a lot of people Chris. had a lot of thoughts about that tweet. I just, I just yes. had to back off since it was it was like too easy at that point. Yeah, it's Chris, so I'd like to know. Like, Chris and I went to college together. Uh-huh. Chris and I spent many an afternoon on the basketball courts at Yates Fieldhouse in Georgetown. Chris is a pretty good basketball player. But this was not a good tweet. This was not good. <laughs> it's just I just it's it's like um it's like Washington, Washington punditry frozen in time. You know, it's like no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter how the political dynamic shift, no matter how bad the Republicans get, it's just like it is this instinctual response to be like, well, maybe both sides. Who knows? You know, people could be people could be more interested in deficit savings. Yeah, no, that's traditionally voters have been very interested in deficit savings. That's usually yeah. There's uh, a long history of voters long history. About that. Long that's what history. Moves Many elections have turned because people were not willing to cut key and popular government services deep enough. I mean, come on now. So, more important question: uh, How does this impact the Senate process? The Senate is writing a bill too. That's where. That's how why we should be scared. Lamar Alexander was interviewed. Uh, he's one of the senators involved, senator from Tennessee, involved in the writing of the health care bill in the Senate. Um, he basically said, who cares about the CBO? We're basically starting from scratch and writing our own bill in the Senate. Here's the problem that I see for the Senate Republicans. For them to improve the CBO score, uh, they would have to spend billions, billions more and cut taxes by billions and billions less for a real improvement of the CBO score. Because, like, are they going to really argue that a bill that only that the CBO says leads to just 20 million uninsured over the next decade or 15 million uninsured over the next decade? Are they going to are they going to pass a bill like that? And then are they really going to try to argue that that's some kind of improvement when the headline for their bill comes out as as 20 or 15 instead of 20, 23? Like, I just I don't know how they do that. This is a very important point. An ad that says Congressman so-and-so voted to take health care away from 23 million people to pay for a nearly trillion dollar tax cut for wealthy Americans is just as effective as an ad that says Congressman or Senator so-and-so voted to take health care from 15 million people to pay for a 500 billion for a half a trillion dollar tax cut for wealthy Americans. It, the number the numbers are so big in this case that. It, the change in this, even by an order of magnitude, is not going to make a much different, a much of a difference politically. But the thing that's also important is that the politically, the Overton window has shifted to the left because the argument here is all about people. Are you going to take health care away from people? And this is where passing whatever happens here that passing the Affordable Care Act was incredibly important in the long run because it changed the dynamic for, that health care. Every American had a right to affordable and accessible health care. We can de- we can debate how to do that. There, you know, maybe someone come up with a conservative solution to that that is to the right of the Affordable Care Act. There are certainly a lot of very good ideas to the left of it, but that's a discussion, right? And once you live in that window, 
it's very hard for Republicans to do something that that passes. It's almost impossible to do something that passes that test. And so let's say they're going to take health care away from 10 million people. They you know, they do this 13 million people better. That's still a really shitty, unpopular bill. Yeah. It is. And look, AARP is already out there. They decided to spend $1 billion on ads targeting five Republican senators, including um, Jeff Flake and Dean Heller, who are both up in 2018 in competitive states, competitive races. Um, Fox News poll came out yesterday. Do you think Obamacare was a good thing or bad thing for the country? 53% said good thing. Only 39% said bad thing. That's a Fox News poll. Uh, in just 2014, it was forty fifty two. It was almost completely reversed uh, just two years ago. So Trump Care did wonders for Obamacare. Um, so basically, where does the Senate process stand right now? Mitch McConnell gave an interview to Reuters yesterday where he was asked about tax reform and health care reform. Tax reform, he said, I feel good about that. I think that's going to be fairly easy. Uh, on health care reform, all he said was, I don't know how we get to 50 votes at the moment. Um, again, McConnell can only lose two votes. And there's about 10 to 12 Republican senators who have expressed serious concern about uh, the House bill or anything like the House bill. So he has a steep climb. Again, that doesn't mean we should just wait and hope that Mitch McConnell fails here. Um, That is probably the worst thing that we can do. The best thing that we can do is keep up the pressure on the Senate, keep up the pressure on Dean Heller, on Jeff Flake, on Susan Collins, on Lisa Murkowski, on Rob Portman in Ohio and and some of these senators in states with um, significant Medicaid populations. And um, yeah, they've got to feel like it is unacceptable for them to pass a bill with a headline that is... 10 million lose health insurance, 15 million lose health insurance, 5 million lose health insurance. Like if they feel that that's unacceptable, um, either they'll pass a bill that basically just tweaks Obamacare and fixes it or the bill more likely the bill will die in the Senate and we'll be able to move on. So yeah. that is that is our goal here, right now. Senate, very keep putting pressure on the Senate. Keep pushing putting pressure on the House too. Yes, for sure. Repo- the, Mitch McConnell cares only about the accumulation of power. And if he thinks moving this forward is going to either cost him the majority in the Senate or cost the majority in the House, then he will be less willing to do so. So Republicans have to believe, and I think this is actually true, that if they move this thing forward, it will open up a hellfire of political anger and frustration and activism that could wash them right out of power. And... All the energy that was there in the first set of town halls has to be there. And this is going to be a long, this is going to be a marathon. Like we and no, you never bet against Mitch McConnell. He is fucking smart and competent and evil. And <laughs> he, and if we're not careful, he will get this thing through. And so we have to remain focused and vigilant. Otherwise, if we, if we turn away and we get all wrapped around Russia or something else important, he will get it through. Like we'll wake up one day and we're like, fuck, they just voted on that. It's over. Yep, that's right. And uh, Swing Left, our friends at Swing Left, are doing another campaign where uh, if you're angry about the CBO score, you can go and donate money to the eventual challenger of every single Republican in a swing district who voted yes for that piece of shit bill. So go to www.swingleft.org slash crooked and go, uh, you can go donate to any of these eventual Democratic candidates who, uh, who can beat some of these Republicans who voted for the bill. So, uh, so go do that today. When we return, we will talk about the budget that the White House released earlier this week with Annie Lowry from The Atlantic. We'll be right back. This is Pod Save America. Stick around. There's more great show coming your way. Pod Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. <laughs> 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 Honestly, it's a treat for me because, as you guys know, I do not prep for the ads, but I find out when you find out what the week's ads are. And look, it's an even bigger treat because I'm looking at a screen right now that just says, your copy here. Oh, cool. <laughs> Tommy John underwear. What do we think? Uh, we really like it. We like it. It's um, comfortable. It's my go-to. Right now, I am wearing non-Tommy John underwear, I'll be honest with you, because... It's Friday. It's Friday. I'm behind on my laundry. I was in New Orleans for John's... Uh, Bachelor weekend, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> where everyone was Bachelor, just running around in Tommy John underwear. <laughs> Bachelor holiday, and obviously when I pack for a trip, I actually make it a point to only pack Tommy John underwear because I don't want to reach in the bag and pull out some old crap. I want the good stuff. <laughs> I'm on. I'm on. No matter vacation. where you are in the world, you want to open that suitcase yeah. and feel the comfort 
and the security of knowing that Tommy John Andor is going to get you through that vacation. I also thought that, like, if I'm going to be discovered dead in underwear, I wanted it to be a nice <laughs> pair. You know, not one of my old pairs. I want to Tommy look John underwear, the only underwear where you feel good being discovered dead. I'll tell you something else, John. I'll tell you something new that you don't know. If Pundit wakes me up at 3 in the morning to go out, I do not put on pants. I just, T-shirt, Tommy John underwear, I'm on the street walking my dog. Emily makes her reset the alarm every night. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, do not take Leo out. <laughs> um, again, we've been talking a lot about underwear, but Tommy John also has the T-shirts. People like the T-shirts. They call them second skin or something. I don't know. It says your copy here. There was a whole thing about the T-shirts. I like the undershirt they sent us. I think they're socks, too. The socks stay up. They don't They don't bunch. Or maybe that's the underwear. Again, I think nothing we're just bunches, making this up. Nothing, nothing bunches. bunches. What should be down stays down. What should be up stays up. Tommy John. <laughs> A better, oh, we're not saying, they're doing that anymore. <laughs> hurry, to, hurry to tommyjohn.com slash cricket and get 20% off your first order. That's tommyjohn.com slash cricket for 20% off. tommyjohn.com slash cricket. Pod Save America is also brought to you by Headspace. Tommy is in the room meditating <laughs> as we speak. Tommy's not even saying a word because he's got Headspace on right now. Tommy, if, Tommy, if your there? mind is totally free. I've never seen him this at ease. Look at that. <laughs> He's silent. It's like he's not. He's a rock. He could sit there for a thousand years. He's a Tommy, stone. Tommy, <laughs> come back to us. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Most problems start in the mind. Fear, anger, stress, anxiety, sleeplessness. They begin in your head, but they can wreck your life. There's like philosophical implications for this. I think these are these are Cartesian ideas. <laughs> okay, meditation can help. And Headspace is meditation made simple. There's a mountain of science showing the positive effects of meditation and mindfulness. I think, therefore I am. And the Headspace app provides guided meditations you can use whenever you want, wherever you want, on your phone, computer, or tablet, even while you're recording a podcast with your friends. They have sessions (laughs) focused on everything from dealing with stress and anxiety to eating healthier, sleeping better, and even being more creative. Like when you're recording ads. It's 1% of your day that can change the other 99. So download the Headspace app and train your mind for a happier, healthier life. Learn more at headspace.com slash crooked. That's headspace.com slash crooked. Tommy, okay? I've never seen him so peaceful. (laughs) (laughs) On the pod today, we have Annie Lowry from The Atlantic. Annie, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. I was on your pod way back when, when you were still doing a pod with uh, with Leibovich and and Alex. And yeah, you know, you were, and it's funny because I feel like all we ever talked about on that podcast was how like there was no way that Trump could win; it wouldn't happen. Yep. The Republicans wouldn't let it happen. And lo and behold, <laughs> that was yes, that's that was my sharp analysis. Um, I remember that the name of that podcast was Pod for America, and that was definitely yeah. I think in our mind when we when we named Pod Save America. So. Yeah, we just stole, we just stole, <laughs> we right just there, so. yeah, we just stole. So thank you for that. Um, so we haven't talked yet today about um, Trump's budget. Uh, the White House budget was released earlier in the week, and I think it sort of it got a little bit lost this week in um, with CBO score and now you know. Uh, Republican candidates beating up reporters and all the usual. So um, what did you think about how extreme was Trump's budget? How different was Trump's budget in your mind than the usual Republican budget that might come out from, say, a Paul Ryan? Right. So I think it's important to note that Paul Ryan's budgets are very, very conservative documents, right? right. Like more conservative than the average Republican in the House and Senate. Uh, you know, he's kind of ideological. He has a lot of opinions about government spending. This document is in a lot of ways like yet more conservative. Um, its cuts are just enormous to everything except for military spending. Um, so it's basically Mick Mulvaney's budget plus like Ivanka's child care plan. There's no way like, Republican appropriators could even begin to make the scale of cuts described in it. And what I think is kind of interesting is, like, this is, like all presidential budgets, this is not going to go anywhere. Nobody's going to take this and try to pass it. So, like, what political message is he sending with this? And I guess that the political message is that Mick Mulvaney is in control of the budget in the White House, you know? It doesn't even, you know, it's not even like, you can imagine him doing some kind of, like, red meat, like, Appalachian revitalization program or something like that. You could even just imagine them kind of, like, cutting taxes and saying that that's tax reform would be really popular, but they're not even doing that stuff. There's a real failure of imagination in it, too. 
Yeah, I was trying to figure that out too. I'm like, usually you ha- and we were talking about this with the healthcare bill too. Like, usually you do something that's either good policy, but maybe it's politically un- unpopular, or it's really po- or more likely it's really popular. Uh, it's it's politically popular, but it's really bad policy. This right. seems to be neither politically popular or very good policy, right? Yeah, absolutely. All there is here is cutting. There's like no reform. There's just giant, giant, giant cuts uh, yeah. to everything. Um, and I agree with you that, I mean, it's it's not like easy for me to come up with things that they could have done just for the hell of it um, to kind of run on and sell. Um but they really didn't, it's almost like they didn't put any effort into it. Um, the other thing to note, I mean, it's a very sloppy document. Like that $2 trillion double counting is completely crazy. So what happened oh, there yeah. with, the, with the double counting? Right. So this is just super, super basic budget math, um, where basically they cut taxes, uh, say that that's going to spur growth, um, but then... Instead of that, that growth, sorry, I'm trying to think of an easier way to explain this. Basically, they double count um, the amount of money uh, that would be saved from cuts, right? So they have this kind of $2 trillion error where, like, the two sides of the ledger in the budget don't match up. Maybe that's an easy way to put it. Right. Didn't they, they, they said that the $2 trillion, they have $2 trillion in cuts, and they basically, in the budget, use that money to give a huge tax cut to people. So they're saying $2 trillion goes for right. towards a tax cut, but the $2 trillion right. also goes towards balancing the budget, which you can't yeah, really exactly. balance the budget if you gave away the money as a tax cut, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so this is really, really, really basic stuff. Um, and I think it shows, I mean, I know that they have um, quite a few people in the budget office, but it seems to me that this just shows that they don't actually have enough people doing kind of policy basics. Um, It was actually funny. I wanted to ask you, I'm not sure, do they have like a full team of speech writers in there, right? Like they're just missing a lot of people. And I think that this is one of the things that happens when you kind of are understaffed. I'm really mystified by this because there are career budget people, or a lot of career staff at OMB. So this is not just the typical Trump thing of, you know, a bunch of Fox News pundits and some third tier political operatives getting together and screwing up basics. Like there are people, there are very good people who've been in the OMB for many years who would have caught this. So I don't know whether those people were cut out of the budget because they're thought to be part of some sort of economic deep state or um, they did the, they let it go because it was the only way to get within the 10 year budget balancing window that he promised on the campaign trail. But it's very strange. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. And and yes, like OMB has a huge staff of career people. It's a little bit missing. I've been asking around to try to figure out what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, also, because, you know, like between like Mulvaney has given kind of um, inconsistent answers on this and sort of came out and said, well, this is just like a preliminary document, which is sort of a crazy thing to say. So I think there's there's a good story to be written, which maybe I'll try to chase down like what the hell actually happened there. And Mil- Mulvaney came from the Hus Freedom Caucus, right? And so he was like, I read somewhere that this budget looked a lot like something that the Republican Study Group might put out. The Republican Study Group is like the Freedom Caucus; it's sort of a far right group of Republican congressmen um, who are probably like the furthest right in Congress, right? And that's where Mulvaney came from, and now he's the budget director. So it seems like something that they would put together. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, and I think it's worth, again, like going back to the contrast with the Ryan budget. Uh, Paul Ryan like has proposed a number of really big reforms, you know, like consolidating anti-poverty programs and turning them into a giant block grant. Like just none of that stuff kind of made it into this. Um, there's hmm. really rel- relatively little in way of reform and just a lot in ways of, of, of in terms of cuts. Oof. What do you think are the most... As you look like, let's pretend for a second that some this budget got put into law. What do you think are the most alarming cuts in there? So, um, you know, the cut to the anti-poverty programs are really, really deep, and you would inevitably see an increase in poverty among children, among the elderly, among the disabled. That's very, very troubling, and that's money that is often talked about in both Republican among both Republicans and Democrats as being an investment, right? Like. We don't want kids to grow up in poverty because if we help them when they're young, uh, they tend to have better lives down the line. They pay more taxes, all of that. You know, the cuts to science funding are really, really unbelievably damaging. Um, the other cuts that I thought were really interesting, I mean, this cut infrastructure spending, despite the fact that they've said that they want more of it. 
which is just kind of mystifying, right? Like, yeah. why if you came in and said we're going to like revitalize America, would you would you cut infrastructure spending in here? It's just weird. <laughs> so. A lot of people, everyone's been saying, obviously, this this budget, when it gets to Congress, is dead on arrival. They're never going to pass something like this. But I think the more interesting question is, what does the budget that goes that gets through Congress look like, and how, how close does it look to something like this, right? Like, is this the new starting point for whatever Congress passes? Or, I mean, does Ryan go for some of these cuts? Does Trump, you know, put his foot down when a budget comes from Congress that doesn't include a lot of these cuts? Does Trump even know <laughs> what these cuts are? Like, I'm wondering what the dynamic is from here. Right. So I think that the question is, what... Uh, Republican appropriators can actually stomach Mm -hmm. um, because they at times have kind of like protested the Ryan level cuts and basically said like we can't make these. Um, You've seen this again and again where where Republican appropriators have been the ones to kind of push back on stuff like this and be like no you know this happened in sequestration and I think that the interesting questions are more political um, because right now at this point given the fractiousness of both the House and the Senate um, uh, I think it's kind of hard to see them doing anything other than continuing resolutions, and that was that was sort of hard enough. One thing that I think is kind of interesting that I think that people aren't sort of thinking about at this point is there is this report in Axios that said that Trump almost vetoed the last trillion dollar continuing resolution uh, because it didn't include his increase to military spending. He had requested like fifty four billion dollars um, that wasn't in there, even though there was a, a boost in funding in the overseas contingency fund mm-hmm. and. He had never signaled that he was going to veto it, uh, and apparently they brought in John Boehner to help talk him out of it. I think that that's kind of the interesting thing, too, right? Yeah. If Trump is going to veto Republican spending bills, that's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, so maybe he's been talked out of, out of vetoing others, or maybe he's decided that he wants to insist on, you know, like, pass Ivanka care or else. Um, and all of this also, it just gets caught up in the politics around um, the Health Care Act uh, as well. You know, right. they want to do tax reform, which I think at some point will just mean tax cuts. It's just hard to see them doing anything. Uh, I think there's a good chance that they get to the fall without having passed much, um, uh, uh, just given, <laughs> given what they've been doing and, and how hard it's been politically thus far, which is crazy. I mean, yeah. given that there's Republican control of, you know, unified control. It basically seems like it's, we're getting close to the point where the most they can hope for for victory is pass a bunch of temporary tax cuts, um, pass another continuing resolution to fund the government and raise the debt ceiling um, without catastrophe, which, you know. Well, the debt ceiling is... It seems to get more challenging since our friend Mark Meadows said that he wanted cuts to go along with the debt ceiling. And yeah. how you get that through is 60, 60 votes in the Senate uh, or even out of the Republican House seems very challenging. And where Trump comes out on that will be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's going to come down to, you know, like the Mike Lees of the world. Um, are they going to demand something, you know, something towards a balanced budget? Um, I think so. Um and what's kind of crazy is that I think that actually politically just passing tax cuts would be good for the Republicans. Right. Um, I don't know at what point they're basically just going to say, like, yeah, that's, that's what we have to show for it. Um, <laughs> and I just, you know, and I think that if they end up passing something like the Health Care Act that has passed the House, that's going to be so politically damaging. It is so unpopular. Um, I think that, you know, and I guess that the other question is, right, like, you know, with the Mueller investigation and everything else going on with the Trump White House, at what point do Republicans on the Hill just stop participating with the White House and do what they kind of want to do? Um, yeah. I think that there's a good chance of that happening, too. Um, so last question for you. We've been asking uh, Democratic politicians about an economic vision for the party moving forward. And a lot of them talk about automation and globalization and a lot of the challenges that we face in the economy. Um, but then they get to the solutions and, you know, they're fairly small or typical. Have you run into any good or interesting proposals out there? Um, Because I know you've been writing about some of this stuff recently. Yeah. um, I think that you are going to see Democrats push for something like single payer, a path to single payer, Mm -hmm. um, and universal, like truly universal coverage. Um, I think that's one thing that they see as being politically popular. I think that they're going to push for things like EITC expansion, um, uh, you know, and uh, that's something that Ro Khanna, who's the new member of Congress from Silicon Valley, has been pushing. 
Um, I think that they're going to go really, really big. I think that they're going to go policy populist um, and basically, you know, go to voters in the Midwest and say, hey, like, we're going to raise taxes on rich people and we're going to use it on stuff for you. Um, and, you know, like, I, I, yeah. I don't think that that's a bad bet. Um, you know, one thing that I think that nobody is quite thinking about right now is, you know, there's some chance that the economy does not continue just chugging along. And in what world, you know, in that world, what do Republicans pass and how does that change what... Democrats demand, I think, is a really interesting question. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that that Center for American Progress this week came out with the Marshall Plan for America, which is which was yeah. essentially a jobs guarantee, a federal jobs guarantee, which is pretty. Um, that's that's pretty populist. Yeah, it's very very populist. It's hard to do. I was um, I was a little bit disappointed by the amount of detail in that plan, just because you know they were saying that um, they are hoping to have sort of an employer of last resort program that you could be like a health aide or like a senior care worker. But those are not sort of the jobs that you would classically think of as being part of a jobs guarantee, which are more scalable and don't require a lot of training. So things like kind of crossing guards or beautification. Um, but just in terms, you know, and obviously given that nothing like that is going to pass for the foreseeable future, mm-hmm. in, in terms of just straightforward messaging populism, I think it's really interesting that they've started to go for these kind of big, sweeping, you know, we're going to change the fundamentals, not just sort of tinker around the edge policies. Yeah, it seems like maybe we're learning some lessons from the laundry list of proposals that we've uh, we've done in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or at least, you know, it certainly seems like they, they're, they're thinking that way. <laughs> yeah. Annie, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, and come back and talk to us again soon. Thanks, Annie. Of course. Thanks, guys. All right, take care. Don't go anywhere. This is Pod Save America, and there's more on the way. Pod Save America is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move. Make your next website. Make your next move with a beautiful website from Squarespace. We're going to have to talk about guys, that. I don't know about that. It's I too just, much. It's trying look, too hard, guys. I know that you get send this ad copy to all kinds of podcasts. <laughs> I just want to let you know that this is the podcast where speechwriters have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that ship has sailed a long time ago. I'm just saying. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're presidential speechwriters. We read ad copy. Now. Look, I know, but at the very least, they could you know, give it a once over. Anyway, the good news is Squarespace has award-winning templates that are the most beautiful way to present your ideas online. You can create a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Squarespace also provides award-winning 24-7 customer support and a unique domain experience that's fully transparent and simple to set up. That's important. You don't know technology well, you get stuck, you call up their customer support, they're there for you. They can fix it. It's it's wonderful. Squarespace is used by a wide range of creatives, people, and businesses, musicians, designers, artists, restaurants, podcasters, and more. Use offer code CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's offer code CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain with Squarespace. And, of course, Pod Save America is also brought to you by our good friends at Square Cash and the Cash App. It's liberal Rush Limbaugh. (laughs) I am crushing a fentanyl lollipop, wondering why you won't send me money via the Cash App. Sean Hannity, why does he hate this country? Why? Conservatives attacking the journalists in the state of Montana. Why? Friends, this is the conservative mindset. This is what these people do. They fail to send me cash. Please send liberal Rush Limbaugh cash via the Cash App. He needs the Cash App because he needs to purchase things. Let's just say that uh, I have a habit... And it will not be sated without very, very large amounts of cash via the Cash App. <laughs> Download the Cash App, connect it to your debit or credit card, and immediately start getting cash from your friends and sending cash. It's immediate. It's great. We love the Cash App here. Go download it today. Liberals must fight these conservative traders. Friends! Friends! <laughs> cash App! Thank you. <laughs> On the pod today, we have the host... Of with friends like these, Crooked Media's own Anna Marie Cox. How you doing? As usual, I must answer in Trump adjusted terms. Relatively good. <laughs> I am I am doing better than a lot of people in the world. I'm doing probably better than Trump, who's I'm guessing jet lagged and probably, you know, having to eat food that's not overdone steak. You know, his wife won't hold his hand. So we are <laughs> Yeah, he. How, how how do you think the trip's going? We didn't talk about that yet today, but um, Dan and I were just talking before we got you on the phone about the. Uh, I don't know if you saw the footage at NATO where he looks like he um, pushes the 
Prime Minister of Montenegro out of the way so he can get in the front of the picture. I, yeah, that is like first. the least surprising news since they didn't let Sean Spicer meet the Pope. Like uh, uh, <laughs> now, okay. What was okay? What was your thought on the and Dan? I didn't ask you this either on the uh, on the on the Sean Spicy doesn't get to meet the Pope story. I just like Spicy is like the it, like so I have the cast of characters in the Trump White House. I think Spicy is the saddest. Right. The saddest, yeah, for sure. Like he's like the the lumpy sad one, um, with his gum, you know, only his gum to keep him company. Uh, you know, apparently he he is a devout Catholic, and you know, it's got to have been like an intentional, super petty dig. Like they let Dan Scavino. I thought I said the same thing. <laughs> meet the Pope, but not Sean Spicer. Did- Sean Spicer, who had the he, Ash Wednesday, you know, apparently like everyone knows this about him. He's very devout. Yeah, no, Dan Scavino, but not Sean Spicer. It's a, I don't feel sorry for Sean. Like, obvi- you could see that in the media narrative, it tipped for the first time since Sean declared the Trump had the larger, largest inauguration crowd in history. The media narrative tipped to pity for Sean, but he chooses his public hum- humiliation every day. He does not have to do this. Um, and I think this is as much about Trump as it does about the people around Trump, because when John and I were talking to one of our old Obama colleagues who was telling us a story of when the Pope came to DC in 2015, one of the senior members of the team was manifested for that meeting and took, but was not a particularly religious, took themselves out so that a, uh, a more devout Catholic who was not on the roster could attend. And you would have thought someone in the (laughs) Trump delegation would have been willing to do that, but no, because they hate each other. They hate each other and they're just all super selfish. And I want to just sort of say about Sean, like, I think it is possible to both pity someone and feel they should be punished. You know, like, so <laughs> that's fair. Uh, I, that I, I don't I Sean is responsible for the bad deeds that he does as a good Catholic. He should know that. Um, but you can still feel sorry for him. Like, well, and, you know, and it's still a shitty thing to do. Like, we can all agree. That is what we also we can all agree. It's a shitty thing to do to Sean Spicer. Perhaps he deserves it. But it's but let's uh, it's it's pretty bad. You Their know? cruelty. And like maybe we, you guys have probably already talked about the budget. But like, this is a way that, that Trump's cruelty expresses itself in both large and small ways. Right. Yes. Like its largest expression is in this fucking fake healthcare bill and their budget, and the smallest expression is in shit like not letting Sean Spicer meet the Pope. But he is through and through one of the cruelest public figures. Like since you'd have to go back to like kings, you know, like yeah, the, I can't think of anyone else that with that kind of power who is that cruel off the top of my head. By the way, I I got an email from a reporter uh, yesterday working on a story and they were like so just you know just wanted to get your view on this like don't we think that trump's foreign trip has gone relatively well and he's gotten <laughs> just about everything they could have expected out of it like don't you have to admit you have to, you have to give him some credit on the foreign trip and i'm like what i thought you didn't talk to chris Lizza. <laughs> <laughs> we brought up that tweet earlier um, okay no i and i i <laughs> You know what? I like I held it together and I just moved on to other things in my inbox and I just I decided not to engage. But I'm like, okay, like yeah, I guess he didn't start any actual wars while he was on a foreign trip, but like, like we can we can start pointing out the gaffes along the way at this point, right? I, like, oh my oh my god. I mean, you guys who haven't covered this, so you guys didn't cover like the whole like we got just got back from the Middle East. No, no, we didn't even <sighs> cover that cuz that we god. on Monday's pod that hadn't happened yet. And so uh right. and of course we had we had, today we covered CEO, CBO, we had budget with Annie Lowry, and then, um, and of course, we started with uh, Greg Gianforte having <sighs> a um, a literal violent reaction to the CBO score. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get, you know, there's something wrong with your bill <laughs> when when with people you'd rather punch a reporter than talk about the CBO score. Yeah, I, so the foreign trip, so the errors, large and small. The one of the smaller ones, but fitting ones, was he just he told. You know, the assembled um, dignitaries in Israel, we just got back from the Middle East, to which you can see someone literally face palm in the background. <laughs> like there is someone who commits an actual face palm when he says that. Yeah. And so, then, and then today, I mean, of course, credit to the reporter, the email for us from yesterday, but today gets up there and gives a speech at NATO where he doesn't, um, 
sort of recommit to Article 5, which is the most important part of the NATO treaty, which says if one right. member of NATO is attacked, we're all attacked and we all uh, we all jump in to defend anyone who's attacked. Attack on one is an attack on all. That is we- literally the definition of a treaty. Right. That, that is like <laughs> the central part of the treaty. And he did not reaff- he did not reaffirm that commitment during his speech. Instead, he chided them for not paying their dues and made some snotty comment about how the new um, the new NATO, whatever it was, that the building that they were in was like brand new and really fancy and probably cost a lot. Oh, my God. So we, we already are working in the assumption that like everything that Trump says as an accusation to someone else is actually a reflection of his own behavior. Right. Like right, right. everything. So who doesn't pay his contractors? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trump, who creates gaudy, garish, terrible, you know, gold dripping buildings that are actually kind of shitty trump i mean like he's just he's just an id like an out of control and also like this other stuff from this trip like i was joking about how i'm doing better than trump because he's probably like crabby like a baby mm-hmm. um the latest you know, latest thing about they're concerned about trump's screen time as if he were a toddler like <laughs> they're trying to manage his screen time. That is the way that parents talk about their three year old. It is not the way that like age. Should... Did you guys have to manage, you know, Obama's screen time? Can, you know, was that like, we're well, like oh, we no. got to put the parental <laughs> well, block on yeah. the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> no, on the iPad, he just basically had like the top headlines. He didn't have Twitter. I remember he would always on his iPad. He would look at like what were the most shared or like most popular stories uh, in the Washington Post and the New York times that's sort of how he kept up on the news yeah he never he, he never got into twitter did he have opinions on whether or not you should kill baby hitler did you guys... <laughs> yeah he did he did not he, did, he, did. he knew exactly what color that dress was <laughs> <laughs> he did not get into all that. no i saw today that the only app on trump's phone um abroad is twitter which is scary but also uh he hasn't been tweeting which is um that yeah, has been a nice part of this week is that there haven't been any tweets from trump I and mean, that's the low bar that the reporter was referring to right i right, mean it's right. like that is he, it that is he it. hasn't tweeted he hasn't made things actively worse but you know like i was thinking the other day that this ben carson quote would be a full news cycle story if it had happened in any other administration which is right. ben carson the head of the housing and urban development department said that poverty is, quote, a state of mind, which is what I thought, like, Margaritaville was, <laughs> you know. The, but uh, I don't want to go to I, that. That's a sucky license plate, by the way. Po- <laughs> poverty is a state of mind. <laughs> we would be having a whole, and he talks about the culture dependency and stuff, and we would be having a whole discussion about that, right? I yes, mean, we would. That would that would take up a couple of days. In, um, instead, you know. So who's on who's on the show this week? Oh, yes. Uh, well, first, uh, Bob Inglis, who is a former congressman from South Carolina, mm-hmm. who is now a climate change activist. He is a still a conservative, wow. uh, somewhat of a Republican. He's a little wary of that label these days, as a lot of you know good Republicans are. Mm-hmm. But he came around on climate change, uh, in part due to some family experiences and in part due to just being open-minded to the science. And we... People can learn about his evolution. It's been fairly well covered in other areas, but we talk specifically how would you how do how can listeners talk to their parents or in laws or whatever about climate change if they don't already agree with it? Like what are some like like really practical tips for starting a conversation with someone who you who you feel like you need to bring on board for climate change? So uh, That's talk great. to him. Yeah. It was really interesting. He winds up giving Kellyanne credit for one rhetorical strategy. And I'll just oh, wow. that'll be a teaser. Um, he says she she used she uses it for evil, but it is a good rhetorical strategy. Oh well, we have to tune in to listen to that one. And then I also talked to uh, Liz Brunig, who people she's an active Twitterer for those of people yeah. who are um, you know avid uh, politics journalists, um, Twitter consumers. Uh, and she's also covers religion and politics, uh, Christianity and politics. And I'd been wanting to talk to her for a while about prayer. And unfortunately, this week, you know, brought uh, some very overwhelming reasons that we might have uh, to pray. Um, and so we talked about, you know, praying in times of tragedy and praying uh, in more routine times and what that does uh, for you and one's relationship with not just, you know, the big guy, but also to your fellow humans. Oh, cool. Yeah, I do. I 
I follow her on Twitter quite a bit, so that'll be an interesting one. Yeah, and um, she's like she's a she's a, she's a Catholic girl. Like, uh, you know, you're not a Catholic girl, but I know that's that's your origin story. So excellent. Be- so that'll be up tomorrow morning. Yep. yep. Friday morning. Everyone go uh, go download it, subscribe to with friends like these, and listen in. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, guys. I you know I, ha- I hope you have a good long weekend. Oh um, yeah, that's right. It's a long weekend. Yeah. Are you guys taping? Yeah, what does that Monday? mean for Monday's Pod Save America? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I almost forgot this, guys. I had this written down. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so so for those of you who've listened to the end, which all of you do, you get a special, first of all, John Lovett's here. L- John so Lovett's that, here. That's a bonus for you. <laughs> I come here to do at commerce. I'm here to record ads. He's re- <laughs> <laughs> here to record some ads. Um, so Pod Save America will not have a Monday episode. Because on Tuesday, we will be joined in studio by the senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren. Oh, my goodness gracious. She will be in Los Angeles. She will be joining John and Tommy and I right here in studio. So that'll be Tuesday. She's a real spitfire, I hear. Yes. I hear she's an up-and-comer. I'm reading her book over the weekend. Being recognized more and more. It's called The Fight is Our Fight to Fight. Yeah, I, I can't wait till Love It interrupts her like Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> and yet she persisted. <laughs> Nevertheless, he persisted. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that's actually that's my book about that's my book about working with Love It. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like he insisted yeah, than, yeah, yeah, than exactly. persisted. That's I would right. say. But um, all right, everyone, that's all the time we have for today. And okay. um, uh, Love It and I are going to record some ads. Anna, have a great three-day weekend. Dan, have a great three-day weekend, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. All right, bye, y'all. All right, bye, guys. All right, take it easy. <laughs>